It is the anniversary of a historic speech of Dr. Ambedkar in the Constituent Assembly, delivered on 25th November 1949, when he completed his work as chairman of the drafting committee of the Constitution. I'm sure that you are all familiar with that speech. This was one of, Dr. One of Dr. Ambedkar's most significant and magnificent speeches, and I wish it were made essential reading in all schools and colleges. This speech and the adoption of the Constitution the next day marked a transition from despair to hope. The decade that was coming to an end, the 1940s, had seen a long series of disasters and catastrophes. Millions of people had died in the Second World War. The Bengal famine of 1943 had also killed millions of people. India had gone through a violent petition, killing more people. The first war between India and Pakistan had been fought. And even in peacetime, people's living conditions were appalling. Life expectancy in India at that time was just around 32 years or so. Literacy rate was around 18%, and there was poverty, hunger, and oppression everywhere. In this situation, the completion and adoption of the Constitution was a ray of hope. It gave some hope that India would embark on a new journey towards democracy and a better life. I would like to take this opportunity to comment on some of the setbacks we are experiencing today on that journey, including organized attacks on democracy, state-sponsored communalism, and the active promotion of irrationality. Understanding the method behind this madness is the first step towards resisting it. The title of my talk is Democracy and its Discontents, and what I have in mind is two very different types of discontent, which might be called forward-looking and backward-looking discontent, respectively, or if you like, constructive discontent and reactionary discontent. Constructive discontent recognizes the limits of what passes for democracy today and demands more democracy and more equality. Reactionary discontent disputes the value of democracy itself. Dr. Ambedkar's historic speech in the Constituent Assembly on 25th of November 1949 is a model of constructive discontent. He wanted more democracy, not less. The speech is full of warnings against the dangers of being content with the form rather than the substance of democracy, including the danger, as he put it, that democracy would retain its form but give place to dictatorship, in fact, a prophetic warning. As you know, Dr. Ambedkar had a far-reaching vision of democracy. He saw democracy not just as a form of government, but also as a mode of associated living. Along with liberty, he regarded equality as a fundamental democratic value. He argued that in order to reconcile liberty and equality, we must cultivate a sense of solidarity, or what he called fraternity. He saw ethics as an essential foundation of democracy, and most importantly, he insisted that political democracy is incomplete without social and economic democracy. All this was summed up with characteristic clarity in a few lines of this historic speech. He said, political democracy cannot last unless there lies at the base of it social democracy. What does social democracy mean? It means a way of life which recognizes liberty, equality, and fraternity as the principles of life. Without equality, liberty would produce the supremacy of the few over the many. Equality without liberty would kill individual initiative. 
Without fraternity, liberty and equality could not become a natural course of things. It would require a constable to enforce them. I'm sure you have all heard this before. Ambedkar's vision of democracy, however, fell into oblivion soon after the Constitution came into effect. The link between political and social democracy, sorry, between political and social democracy was largely forgotten. The web of economic and social inequalities in which poor people are entangled continued, continued more or less unchanged. Some of these inequalities have intensified, some have reduced, but the basic structures of oppression remain the same, whether it is the caste system, patriarchy, capitalism, or communalism. Solidarity, of course, failed to develop, except possibly within specific castes or communities. The other day I was reading a book that many of you must know called Ants Among Elephants by Sujata Gidla. There's a very interesting story in it where the village where she is is in danger of being destroyed by the flood. And then she describes how everyone starts helping each other. They start welcoming each other in their homes and so on, but only within the caste. Everyone is helping each other within the caste, and nobody is trying to help uh, the entire community. The result of all this is an odd kind of democracy, where democratic institutions work very well for the privileged and very badly, if at all, for the rest. In other words, democracy for the few, which is a contradiction in terms. Democratic institutions in India work wonders for those who are well-off and well-educated. If you belong to that privileged class, you have vast possibilities of political participation and social action. You can say whatever you like, air your opinions in the media, send questions to the parliament, seek justice from the courts, meet the chief minister, and perhaps even contest elections, if you wish. At least all this was true until very recently. Few countries in the world have so much political freedom to offer. The same institutions, however, are mostly out of reach of the casual laborer, domestic worker, and rickshaw puller, with the significant exception of periodic elections. Some of these institutions, in fact, are not just out of reach of poor people, they are also turning against them and becoming instruments of oppression. A prime example of this is the legal system. Poor people have no hope of obtaining justice from the courts. Extensive rights to workers which are enforceable in court, like work on demand, minimum wage, payment within 15 days, a basic facility of the work salary, unemployment allowance, these are all rights enforceable in court. And I don't think that a single NIG worker so far has been able to realize all these rights. And yet, to my knowledge, not a single worker so far has gone to court to try to enforce these rights. Because they feel the court is not for them, it's actually dangerous to go there, it will be expensive, it uh, will be entangled in mitigation, uh, and so on and so forth. I want to mention specifically uh, one case, because it's right here outside Patna, not just of people being unable to exercise and enforce their rights under the Internal Guarantee Act, but also of being harassed using the legal system because they try to stand up for their rights to other means. Uh, this is the case of an organization called Samaj Parivartan Shakti Sangratan in Mudapakur, uh, which was founded by a man called Sindhi Sahani Sahani. The workers there have very courageously and to a large extent even effectively fought together for their rights under the Internal Guarantee Act and to expose corruption in an IAG. And now they are facing tremendous repression, including a whole series of false cases. Sandeep Sahni himself has something like 10 or 12 or 15 uh, false cases on him. And just a few days ago, he even received an email from the Chief Minister's office CC to the DGP, sending him, forwarding to him rather, 
an email which is supposed to have been sent by him, that it was, it was sent from his account by fraud, to the chief minister's email address, saying just one line in the subject line, Pachis November Ko, which happens to be today, Pachis November Ko, Mukhi Mantri Ko, or Padam Mantri Ko, Mara Jaira, Iliko, Bashanika, and Himat Khaitan Bashara. Now, you can imagine, now I know for a fact that he didn't send that email, it's absolutely impossible. So, this is the kind of means that are used and that is a new use also against the advice of the like Siddha Bharadwaj um, and others recently to frame people who are becoming inconvenient and who are challenging people in, in positions of power. It is not as if nothing could have been done around the time of independence to bring about a semblance, at least, of social democracy. Just to give one example, universal quality education could have done a great deal to reduce the vulnerabilities and inequalities that ruin people's lives and undermine social democracy in India. But this did not become a serious priority of public policy until much later, except in a few states like Kerala and Tamil Nadu, who did very well from it. And even today, India's schooling system perpetuates instead of reducing social inequality, privileged children study in fancy private schools while poor children are still deprived of the most basic schooling facilities. Uh, last month we were doing a survey in Lapeha district in all the hamlets where children, where people from the so-called uh, particularly vulnerable tribal groups reside, the PDPG communities. We surveyed about 15 to 20 villages not one of these villages had a properly functioning school. And this is a monumental injustice that is being done to these children who are going to be condemned to join the ranks of casual laborers instead of developing their abilities and capabilities. Leaving social democracy aside for now, political democracy itself is not in the pink of health. All the aberrations continue, including, for instance, the first past the post system, a very odd notion of secularism, a series of anti-democratic laws, and gross human rights violations to mention a few. I don't have time to elaborate on those. I mention them because they are all within the Constitution. And you should remember that in the, we are of course all for defending the Constitution, we have said that several times earlier today, and I am fully with that. But the Constitution is not immutable. In fact, with the same speech that I mentioned earlier, Dr. Ambedkar mentioned that we have made it a point to make it relatively easy to amend the Constitution because the Constitution is not immutable and if it can be improved, it should be improved. Now, of course, this will come back to point us uh, in a very different kind of modification of the Constitution. In the last few years, the very foundations of political democracy have come under attack. An obvious example is the freedom of expression. Freedom to speak and write without fear is one of the most basic civil liberties. It is one of the political liberties that India seemed to have achieved in substantial measure until recently. Today, it lies in tatters. NGOs have stopped talking about economic and social rights for fear of their, of their SCRA being cancelled. Newspaper editors treat the government with kid gloves to protect their advertisement budgets. Political opponents are muzzled with tax rates and other investigations. Who would have thought that it would be so easy to make so many people and institutions fall into line so quickly? And what is just as worrying as these attacks on the freedom of expression is how little resist resistance there is to them. How many vice chancellors have considered it important to defend their students' freedom of expression? How many editors have made it a point to resist the government's efforts to prevent the publication of adverse news and views? How many publishers have risked their profits to fight for the right to publish a novel or book? deemed objectionable by some fanatics. Who would have thought that the foundations of Indian democracy 
even in the limited sense of political democracy, were so fragile. All this calls for strong rules of the sort of constructive and forward-looking discontent that, that Dr. Ambeka had expressed in his historic speech of 25th of November 1949. Meanwhile, however, there is a growing discontent of a very different sort, what I would call backward-looking or reactionary discontent. This takes the form of denying the value of democracy itself and calling for authoritarian rule or for some mythical alternative like Ram Rai. The mainspring of this reactionary discontent is the Hindutva movement. Why is the Hindutva movement hostile to democracy? In the time that remains, let me propose an answer to that question. In a nutshell, I would argue that this hostility arises from a resistance of the upper caste to the egalitarian demands of democracy. The essential ideas of Hindutva are not difficult to understand. You can read about them on the website of the RSS, or if you have time, in the writings of leading Hindutva thinkers, Sekshwar Savarkar and Golwalkar. For instance, in the book, Essentials of Hindutva by Savakar, or We or Our Nation Defined by Gorwarkar. Incidentally, the fact that the story is much the same on the RSS website and in these much older books is one indication that the essential ideas of Hindutva have been remarkably stable over time to this day. The main purpose of Hindutva is to unite the Hindus and bring about a Hindu rest in India. The term Hindu is supposed to have a cultural rather than religious connotation and may include Sikhs, Jains, and Buddhists, but not Christians and Muslims because their motherland is elsewhere. The basic idea is that India belongs to the Hindus. Incidentally, both Sadaka and Murwaka use some extraordinary arguments to develop this idea, including many arguments that stand no scientific scrutiny whatsoever. There is no time to go into the details. Let me just give you one example. In his book, We or Our Nationhood Defined, Murwaka argues that Hindus belong to one race, the Aryan race. That itself isn't scientific, but there is more. At one point, he has to contend with the claim, held to be true at that time, that Aryans came from somewhere north of India, in fact, near the North Pole. He deals with this claim by arguing that the North Pole itself used to be located in India. I quote, the North Pole is not stationary, and quite long ago it was in that part of the world which is called Bihar and Orissa at the present, like here. Yeah. Then it moved northeast, and then by a sometimes westerly and sometimes northward movement, it came to its present position. We were all along here, and the Arctic zone left us and moved away northwards in its zigzag march. Isn't that interesting? The North Pole zigzagging away as we are staying in place. He did not explain how the Aryans managed to stay in place as the North Pole was zigzagging away, as if the North Pole was a kind of carpet that you can pull and that you can see. But anyway, coming back to the main story. By the way, this anecdote is interesting because it illustrates the fact that when we or our nation would define, Gorbachev clearly says, that the Hindu framework of society, as he calls it, is characterized by Varnas and Ashrams. In another book, Bunch of Thoughts, he extols the virtues of the caste system, at least in its traditional form. He says, the caste system continued for thousands of years of a glorious national life. There is nowhere any instance of its having hampered 
the progress or disrupted the unity of society. In fact, the caste system serves as a great bond of social cohesion. Can you imagine this? The caste system is acting, according to him, as a great bond of social cohesion. In other words, Savarkar, Bolwarkar, and other founders of Hindutva had no problem at all with caste. They were quite happy with caste. What they had a problem with is what they called casteism. And casteism, in their vocabulary, is not a reference to caste discrimination. Casteism refers to things like Dalits asserting themselves. That is casteism because it is divided. Or what I'm saying today for them would be also a form of casteism. So these were the views of leading Jinkwa and Jalons, such as Salata and Gurwata, of whom our Prime Minister, incidentally, is a great admirer. And uh, the extract that Arunati read earlier of Narendra Modi's book uh, shows or illustrates that his views are also very similar to those of these thinkers. Still, you might think that these views are